Thank you for watching our CBSN Originals. Period. Half the population has one, but no one ever wants to talk about it, even in places where almost the entire population is female. I'm talking about women behind bars. The sentencing project estimates that over 200,000 women are incarcerated, and that means every day inmates are experiencing their periods while in prison. But what happens when there's not enough reliable access to pads or tampons? Well, to find out, CBS News senior producer Christina Capititis sat down with Topeka Sam. She's the director of Dignity for Incarcerated Women, and she herself served time in federal prison. You have personally experienced what it is like to be incarcerated in America and experience your period while behind bars. Tell us about that. So while I was incarcerated um, for three years in federal prison, I had uterine fibroids. And for women or people who understand what that is, they're these benign tumors um, or could be malignant. But And you have heavy cycles, um, longer cycles, so opposed to the average three to seven days or five days. Mine would be two weeks, sometimes a month. And though I had support and I had resources which allowed me to pay for menstrual pads, um, only a pack a week. Sometimes I needed more. So whatever they issued, which were very thin and flimsy, cheap, um, what I was told I needed to do was I had to quantify my cycle, which means I had to put the used pads in a brown paper bag, show them to a male officer so that he can issue me more pads. And just to go through that experience and you know the lack of dignity, the dehumanization, the um, trauma, that it consistently um, caused to me, I quickly realized that it was most likely happening in even harsher ways for women who did not have additional resources or even the will or courage to speak up. And so when I came home, um, myself and other formerly incarcerated women began to organize first on a federal level um, with the Dignity for Incarcerated Women Act, which was co-sponsored um, by Senator Booker and Warren at the time, Senator Warren at the time. Um, and from that, it was introducing to make sure that women have proper hygiene products while they're incarcerated, that um, we're ending shackling of women during child labor, making sure that children are within a specific proximity so they're not thousands and thousands of miles away from their parents. They can be within a 500 mile driving radius, um, allowing for other formerly incarcerated people to go back into the prisons for programming because we know what each other needs. And so, women wanted to lead this effort on a local level. So state by state, formerly incarcerated women actually helped to draft legislation, um, pass legislation, and to date we've been able to pass 14 pieces of legislation on a state level around the country, and then also um, on the federal level in the First Step Act, we were able to get the dignity provisions in there, so no one will have to experience what I did um, or others who are in this campaign and in this work um, while in federal prison. If you don't have the resources to be able to buy pads yourself and you are incarcerated, how many pads a week do, or, or month do they give you and are they sufficient quality? Well, definitely not sufficient quality. Um, they, it changes from prison to prison, jail to jail. Typically it can be anywhere from five pads a week. Sometimes it's a pack of pads a month, which I think where I was, it was about 12 pads, which again, I'm going through about five pads a day sometimes when I had these heavy flows. And so you go through that and then you're looking at like, what do you do, right? So women would make tampons, they would use clothes, whether it was a t-shirt, whether it was socks to make pads so that they wouldn't, you know, go through and, and, and mess their uniforms. And so, excuse me, it just gets me a little upset um, just to could just relive that, that it's, it's just so, for anyone to think that that's okay, um, for anyone to think that that's okay, Anywhere, I mean, I'm not even just going to say America it is, I mean, like, where is their lack of, where, where is their lack of, where's their compassion? Where's their empathy? You know, where's their understanding? I mean, you know, having your cycle is something that is given to women from God. It's not something that we choose, you know, um, and to be treated and demoralized in that capacity because we have it within incarceration. Um, it's terrible, you know, and so 
you know, we do this work because we do look to decarcerate. We understand the importance of making sure that women are not in prison. We know that there are alternatives to incarceration. We know that you can um, heal people and you can rehabilitate people. Um, and people can be responsible for the actions and be accountable for the actions without having to be locked up in a cage, right? And so, but while we look to decarcerate, and end incarceration of women and girls. We cannot forget the conditions of confinement that we were in, and so we have to make sure that they're more humane for the people that we left behind. Do you feel as if America's prisons were created with men in mind? Absolutely. You know, um, I mean, when you think about it, nothing was really created with women in mind, um, whether it's America or anywhere else in this, in this world. You know, women are m marginalized. We're always the last one for anything, any type of rights, whether it's voting rights, um, you know, we're still fighting to make sure that we have equity in employment, you know, and our wages. And so, you know, when you think about the least of them, you know, the population of people who that incarcerated, then women are definitely um, not thought of. And then severely penalized uh, because we're women. And, you know, I remember thinking, well, why are we you know, we're sitting in this prison with no resources, no educational opportunities, um, and how does the system expect people to really be able to transform their lives and come home and not come back, right? And so for women, I know where I was, we had for adult continuing education courses outside of GED or ESL, um, there was knitting, crocheting, plastic canvas, and beading. And of course, these are gender specific classes. I felt like I was in a home ec. Um, I actually did not knit because I said, this is not my thing. Um, but to think that this is what's supposed to prepare you to come home, to have marketable skills, to be able to be competitive in the workforce is ridiculous. If you could say one thing to women at home who maybe never even realized this was an issue, why is this so important? Well, this issue is important because Americans who are in uh, the prison systems are American citizens, right? You know, we fight for people who are, you know, immigrants at the border. I think that's an important issue. There are children who are separated with, from their parents because of incarceration, you know, millions of children, and we're not looking at that. And so when I think about the fact that the numbers show that there's one in every other adult that has had an incarcerated person in their, in their family life, we can no longer deny this issue and act like it's someone else's issue. That there's someone that you know who has been incarcerated, someone that maybe the family called the black sheep or called the bad apple, right? That, you know, you need to start thinking about that because we can't keep throwing our people away. And the fact that as women, as mothers, as, as, as nurturers, as people who are maternal, you know, we are, and you know, Mother Earth, we're wisdom, you know, we're all of these things that we have to begin to change this system like we've changed every other movement. And so I encourage, you know, women to one, look into the work that we're doing. I encourage women to go find out what's happening in their local jail go to their constituencies, go to the elected officials, go to their senators, find out what's going on in the prisons or jails that are in their counties, their cities, and their states. And I think once they become more informed and educated and understand that, you know, by the grace of God, there go I. Like, everyone has made a mistake. Some people got caught for them, their mistakes. Some people have been criminalized for poverty. Some people have been criminalized for the color of their skin. You know, and when we have an opportunity, when we have resources, when we have access, it is really our responsibility to make sure that we're putting that on to other women and other people. And so I encourage people to just use their voice and making sure that we can get the change done that we need. Coming up, we've got more of our conversation with Topeka Sam. After the break, she shares what you can do to help women in need and what misperceptions might be hurting any progress. It was not a great depiction of people. So it appeared that people who were incarcerated should be there um, until I went. Plus later, cowboy boots, sunflower seeds, and Mardi Gras beads are all tax exempt in some states 
where tampons are not. We take a look at why. Coming up, what's behind the so-called pink tax? You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on.